great. But I don't want to wait. No, 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 no. I want it now, now, now. <laughs> so we have started the broadcast, and we're just at a minute before. So I will do the usual rigmarole. Let us know if you can see here us on YouTube. And uh, we'll just uh, carry on for, you know, handful of moments to see uh, what transpires. All right. Let uh, me just do a voice test here because I'm watching on YouTube live now. All righty. And, um, you know, in order for there to be a voice test, there has to be speaking. So... I will continue to talk to myself as I probably do in my sleep anyways. So Wow, there's a huge delay. About it's usually at least seven seconds. As usual, my my sound is crap, but okay. It's that metal plate in your head, I swear. Yes. I mean, you should never have let the military do all those experiments. Did you at, no. did you at least get paid for your time? <laughs> I don't know. I sound like I'm recording out of a metal tube or something. Well, I mean, you are at a seance, kind of. <laughs> Coming to you from the great beyond. And he says that he hears me. Yay. Well, um, should I wait for anyone else to show? Or? Oh, wait. One, I, for no particular reason, wait one more minute. I know. I mean, you know, the the breadsticks at this restaurant are so good. Why not give it another moment? Yes. <laughs> That's how they get you, you know. You, you, you won't have as much of the real food if you fill up on the, on the bread and the beverages. Oh, you know what? I never thought of that. But you're right. <laughs> That is why, isn't it? Mm hmm I have a guilty pleasure. Yeah, I know. I sound like I'm in a tunnel, and I don't know how to fix it. Let me just see. I did. I did. Ugh. I'm not sure, but Skype might have some settings in it for noise canceling. Well, yeah. Let me just take a look. Uh-huh. Well, Toppy, or uh, Tommy, Toppy might be in a tunnel, but uh, you're in a cornfield. <laughs> uh, I came up with a, a nickname for um, the, the little hamlet that the Bran Barn exists in. I'm going to be calling it Corn Meadows. Corn Meadows? Yeah. Uh -huh. In a, in a forthcoming episode of uh, Surely You Jest, I actually meant to release it at the beginning of the week, but I didn't want to shock anyone because that would be like two episodes in one week, and I haven't done that in a coon's age. Maybe I shouldn't say that because I think that's supposed to be racist. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. Okay, maybe that's the problem. Oh, that... you sound closer now. Okay. All right. I, I think that may have been the problem. Oh, we're cooking with gas. And speak about Victorian age. <laughs> yeah, I apparently didn't have the right microphone selected. Uh oh Hey, shall I do a quick sound test to see if maybe that fixed things for us? Sure, try it. All right. So uh, I'm going to play a, a loony bird. Did that come across? Well, I didn't hear it on my earphones. Oh, well, Gertrude, you're but deaf maybe, as a post. Just kidding. Maybe maybe Tommy heard it. <laughs> no corn, right. just grassy fields. Billy's here. Yay! Yeah, why don't we start? Okay, I gotta say a quick hello. Let's see. All righty, so I'm gonna, um, you know, implore the action here. Good evening and welcome to the beautiful, historical Marionette Theater. Tonight we're going to be taking a step back to a time uh, after the Industrial Revolution uh, with some sleights of hand, 
some parlor tricks and trickery and uh, some prestidigitation. Yes, and uh, some tragedy. But uh, David Bowie makes an appearance, so everything's going to be okay. Uh, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. And uh, it is a, uh, well, it's not a hot time in the town tonight. I said that last time. Maybe I'll wake up eventually here. Um, <laughs> I hear we are in for some nice weather this weekend, Mr. Smelly. Um, I have not heard, but um, it's been, uh, well, it's been rather unseasonably coolish. It has. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it rained every day this last week here in Western New York. Um, yes, off and on, off and on, <laughs> off and on. By the way, <clears throat> frankly, I rather like temperatures in the high 50s, mid 60s. So I haven't minded that in the least tiny bit. Well, you know, I often tell folks that my favorite times of year are the most picturesque here in, uh, in our, our Apple country state of New York. Um, and those are typically fall because we get the beautiful colors of Tuscany. But with the rainy weather that we've been having, I'm betwixt because I'm starting to like spring more. And I tell you what, with some of my afternoon, well, not afternoon, but my sunset walks, I feel like I'm traipsing through a Bob Ross painting. <laughs> it's just gorgeous. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> see, I even like dreary, foggy days because of atmospheric perspective, which is in the fog, things far away are blurry Things closer or uh, things nearer are more in focus. And to me, that's visually very interesting. So hmm. that um, reminds I, me that I got my first pair of bifocals recently. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Uh, I never got used to them, DJ. And oh. so I, I said, forget about it. I threw them away. <laughs> well, um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's a few things coming around. You know, we're, we're uh, firmly into spring, and uh, just more than a week away, we've got uh, the uh, the day that celebrates our mother figures. Mother's Day is the 14th, and uh, I'm sure you'll give us a full report on that. Um, my mother figure at this point is my mother-in-law, Mama Billy, and she just recently turned 80, but I didn't get to go to her birthday because that was while I was at work. But that's those are the breaks. Um. <laughs> that was the break. I'll be at work on Mother's Day. I've I haven't been able to, to basically attend Mother's Day, you know, official Mother's Day events for the last eighteen years. Hey. <laughs> so. Well, you know what else is happening here soon, uh, Toppy? What? Uh, what? Well, and you know, hats off to our friends across the pond. Um, and it's meant in good humor. Charlie Bucket, my nickname for uh, Prince Charles, he's oh, yeah. finally finishing his temper tantrum, and he's going to get the crown. Uh, so, Coronation Day is what, Sunday over there? I do or believe tomorrow? so, yeah. And um, there's been some special music written up, and I'm forgetting who the composer is, but... Um, well, but John Williams, probably. Oh, uh, maybe. No, I doubt it. I doubt oh, it. I wouldn't be surprised if it's it. Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, nice. But, you know, uh, speaking of fabulous royalty, there's also a little thing kicking off shortly here called Eurovision Hoppy. I, I am not a devout follower of this, but it is a very popular sort of Olympics of musicians over there in the Europe's. And it's it's basically uh, lovingly referred to as the Gay World Cup because the most outrageous in camp acts get up on stage, and they try to win the prize, which is, I guess, a, a record deal, maybe? But uh... Well, um, I don't know how to watch this thing, but I see it in my feed, because apparently I follow on Twitter lots of people who are really into Eurovision. 
but I only heard about it maybe in the last five years. Never, never in my life heard about it. Never heard anyone mention it until about five years ago on a podcast, probably. So uh, I, 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 I mean, it's been going on forever, right? I, mean, I don't know about forever. I, I know that it's probably been more than a decade, and we're only just learning about it here in the states because. Um, you know, in more recent years, some of those companies have decided to be less picky about what they can share. Like, it used to be that uh, when uh, Doctor Who released a new episode in the UK, you couldn't see it anytime soon in America. We had to wait possibly even months before we got it, and then it got closer. It was you know, uh, a few days later. And then finally they made it so that it was just a few hours apart because of the age of the internet. We don't want fans spoiling it. So we're going to show it to you as soon as possible. And I'm pretty sure if anyone has access to BBC America, you could probably see some of Eurovision, but there are plenty of clips out there. Um, you know, cause these are award winning acts or award nominated acts you just have to be quick to find them because just like any award show, they're probably pulling things for copyright's sake. All right. Um, well, uh, Gertie's around. Yeah, I'm here. Jesus, you guys have been blathering your mouths off. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I, DJ, I think, I think uh, Gertie's ready to do the opening. You know, it's so cute that Gertie tried to dress up as a magician's assistant tonight. Although I think she got her wires crossed because she looks a little bit more like a Playboy bunny. Uh, oh, hardy, har, har, DJ. <laughs> hardy, har. Don't you like my bloomers? Ooh. Uh, anyways. Oh, zip up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, get yourself down there on the, uh, the, uh, the cottontail trail. Okay. I'm and gone. Um, we will, you know, find out what we're watching tonight. All righty. Give me a signal with your hand, DJ, All when right. I'm ready. Uh, this is going to be like uh, Christmas Vacation. Drum roll. Bing! Here you go. And here's our showgirl introducing tonight. Doing it live. Woohoo! All righty. Robert is a happily married entertainer in Victorian era London. After a performance goes terribly wrong, his bachelor business partner threatens to steal his thunder when he starts his own act. In the coming years, they each try to outdo each other. But at what cost? The ultimate price, perhaps? Well, grab a top hat and a cape. It's time for The Prestige with Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman. Woo woo. Take it away, fellas. What do you get when you take a dash to the silver screen? A pinch of golden oldies and a smidge in a scream. It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Toppy. Hell, Victorian wow. era London, Toppy. We haven't been there in a while. I think the last time we uh, discussed something from this realm was when we did that uh, period, uh, sort of a crime drama, Copper. Or no, not Copper. Or... I'm sorry. It was um, Ripper Street. That's right. Ripper Street. Also... Um, all of a sudden, I can't think of it. We did, um, I, I want to say Moment Chance, which is a puppet act from the 70s. <laughs> no, but, but it's, uh, uh, it's the French, um, uh, it was a musical and we did it and it was around that time too. Oh, Am American in Paris. No! No! <laughs> this was, um... Oh, for heaven's oh, sake! Oh, Moulin Rouge. Talk Thank about you. talk about bloomers, but I'm dumb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somehow I got moment chance out of that. Uh, anyway, what's DJ, in your cup? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, why don't you Mine's tell us? Uh, this movie came out in in uh, 2006. Mm -hmm. 
So tell us what was going on in U.S. history in 2006. Okay. U.S. history in 2006. Oh, can you believe it? It was, uh, what was that? 16 years ago? 17 years ago? Uh. Uh-huh. Oh, they're almost uh, legal age to vote now. Anyways, the annual Rose Parade in California was drenched in heavy rain for the first time uh, in 51 years back in 06. Well, I guess that would be rather rare in a desert country. Mm-hmm. Also in 06, IBM, Big Blue, they said that it would freeze their pension benefits for American employees starting in 2008 and only give them a 401k in the future. Oh, well, you know things to come everyone else is doing it oh the uh, the folks that gave us all of our free coasters those cds in the mail america online aol they agreed to pay customers as much as 25 million smackaroonies to settle claims that they wrongly billed them for some online services and products some i wonder what those were and in <laughs> uh, space uh, nasa they, the Stardust mission successfully ended. It was the first to return just from a comet. And, you know, wow. those could, that could be a fragment from another world. NASA also launched the New Horizons spacecraft, which was a nine-year mission and three billion miles of space to fly by and observe the dwarf planetary system of Pluto Charon, which, of course, is no longer listed as a planet. It's a dwarf. And possibly... Wait a minute. I think it may have regained its planet status. Hmm. Or maybe not. Well, it's kind of like Jeopardy. It depends on who the host is. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, of course, it also... the. New Horizons also explored other objects in the Kuiper Belt, K-U-I-P-E-R. That's that area out there between Mars and Jupiter. All right. In the sports ball realm, Super Bowl, I don't know what number this is. It's XL. That's a t-shirt size to me. Um, The Pittsburgh Steelers defeated the Seattle Seahawks by a score of 21 to 10. Um, go sports ball. And, uh, it's, uh, it's the homecoming for Detroit native Jerome Bettis, who was the play, who play, who was playing the final game of his 12 year career. That was in 2006. All righty. A few other things in 2006, the United States compete at the winter Olympics in Turin, Italy and won nine gold medals, nine silver and seven bronze. So they got, you know, they got a, a, a whole trunk full of medals there in TV, the CW, like, uh, Charlie Wu Wu CW network debuts as the sixth broadcast network. So after ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, I don't know, PBS, whatever CW, They were formed by the merging of UPN, which was launched by Paramount and Viacom when uh, Star Trek Voyager premiered. It's all very complicated, folks. Yes. They were owned by CBS, and uh, they split from Viacom. And anyways, uh, three days after UPN stopped broadcasting, the CW came into being, and the WB also went the, uh, the way of the dodo. So uh, a couple other things, and I'll have you weigh in because, you know, we talk about um, it, ta- talent in the entertainment world uh, in, in 2006. Now, think of it this way. You go into those thrift stores and you see the old video game systems people drop off, and it used to be everyone saw Atari 2600s. Well, nowadays, you see the Nintendo Wii, which was Nintendo's first disc-based system, that came out in 2006. So, you know, 16 years ago. Also, the Blu-ray uh. came out in the United States. And most people who shop at the Megalomarts couldn't tell you the difference between a DVD and a Blu-ray. And I'm telling you now, a Blu-ray is the kind of disc you want to get if your TV is flat, which everyone's is now. So get with the program. If we don't buy nice things, we don't get to have nice things. And that's why I can't get nice movies because Walmart is selling DVDs, not Blu-ray. Anyways, um, last thing about space, space shuttle mission STS-116. 
on the Space Shuttle Discovery, listed off from Kennedy Space Center on the first night launch since the 2003 loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Now, Toppy, hmm. if you will highlight this section of the news, the 78th Academy Awards celebrating those folks in entertainment. Well... <clears throat> Uh, it was hosted by John Stewart. This by this time I had stopped watching the Academy Awards, which I watched religiously through the seventies and half of the eighties, and then I just like nah. Uh, so I was long. I have I, I haven't seen the Academy Awards this year. Anyways, uh, in that year it was hosted by John Stewart. It was held at the Kodak Theater in Hollywood, where I think it is every year now. And uh, the, the Paul Haggis movie, uh, Crash, controversially won Best Picture. Um, and uh, it was a part of a four-way tie, and winning the most awards with it uh, was Ang Lee's Brokeback Mountain, Peter Jackson's King Kong, Rob Marshall's Memories of a Geisha. Memoirs. Uh, memoir, sorry, and uh, all all of them winning three. Brokeback leads with eight nominations, and with Lee also winning Best Director. And uh, at that time, the telecast garnered uh, nearly 39 million viewers. I don't know where what they're garnering <laughs> today, but I, I suspect it's less. Now, 2006, that was recently enough, and as I was just saying, some people are almost ready to be able to vote now, since uh, they're too young to have made a name for them on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Toppy. Tell yeah. us the sad news. Who left us from the limelight in 2006? Okay, we had um, Lou Rawls uh, at the age of 73. Singer, songwriter, actor. Wilson Pickett left us at 65. He was a singer and songwriter known for In the Midnight Hour. Oh, God, that's such a... Oh, I like that. And uh, Land of 1000 Dances and Mustang Sally. Chris Penn, actor and brother of Sean Penn. Uh, I didn't even know he had a brother. Didn't know. Nope, didn't know. Coretta Scott King passed. Uh, at the age of 79, Don Knotts, nip it, nip it in the bud, uh, passed at 82. Darren McGavin, God bless him, uh, for doing a Christmas story and so many freaking uh, movies and TV movies and uh, theater movies. Darren McGavin, I remember most from Kolchak, The Night Stalker, which was my favorite favorite thing on TV way back in Cheapers. What was it? 74? 75? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maureen Stapleton passed at 81. Uh, she was really made her name on stage, but she was starting to appear in uh, movies. Ah, you would have seen her in Airport 1970, uh, Cocoon, The Money Pit, uh, June Allison died at 89. She, uh, you know, hadn't done... Well, she goes way back. Uh, for example, 1949, she was in Little Women. Um, and other many notable roles. Uh, uh, um, um, Mike Douglas. Do you know Mike Douglas? Well, he used to do a talk show. But, but originally, I think he started as a singer. Uh, he died at 86, and there was Jane Wyatt, uh, who was once married to Ronnie Reagan. She passed at 96. Oh, she was on Father's Knows Best and our Star Trek connection for tonight. She was Amanda on Star Trek. Spock's and, mommy. Uh, yeah, Spock's mom, uh, which she reprised many times, uh, well, a couple, three times uh, in the movies, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek 2 and 3, at, at least. Uh, Fathers knows, oh, uh, blah, blah, blah. James Brown, uh, American musician and songwriter, and, and finally, uh, good old Gerald Ford, our 38th president, died at the age of 93. Uh, tell us, uh, DJ, 
uh, what was going on in theaters, and let us know how our movie tonight did in the box office. Oh, goodness. So, uh, you know, get out your tic-tac-toe boards and your marbles, because we're going to take a crapshoot here. Uh, so, uh, it's no secret we have a soft spot, kind of like in our heads. No? Did I admit that? Um, for the underdog. And, uh, well... It's no secret that this uh, wasn't at the top, but what was at the top, the, the big dogs in the box office in 2006 was one of the many sequels with, um, what's his name, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, brought in $423 million that year. Number two was an animated feature, and this was... Uh, by uh, later acquired by the Mouse House Pixar, Cars brought in $244 million. And the third film in the top of the box office that year was the final of the trilogy starring Mr. Patrick Stewart. Another Star Trek connection there for you folks. X-Men The Last Stand brought in $234 million. No, it's um somewhere around the middle, so it's actually kind of the sweet spot, the prestige, which let's see here, when did this sucker come out into the world? Do 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 looking for prestige? that prestige two thousand six. Yeah, I'm just looking for the time of the year that it came out. Oh, okay. Oh, it was a fall release. It came out just before All Hallows Eve. It was October 20th of that year. So technically, oh. it probably should have only fairly been counted in 2007. But let's go with it. So The Prestige was number 59 at the box office. Brought in 52.4 million. So, you know. It, it might have paid for Christian Bale's Milk Duds and Hugh Jackman's Twizzlers. Yeah, um, it, it, didn't, it wasn't a moneymaker, but it got a lot of critical acclaim. I mean, uh, so. you know, Christopher Nolan was doing it, so if he had fun, he didn't have to, uh, you know, profit. <laughs> but right. um, one better than the prestige was a live action version of charlotte's web and this came out in 2006 as we were saying and it starred up and coming child actress dakota fanning who's among other people worked with tom cruise and Brittany murphy and uh it had a cast of voices by celebrities of all the different barnyard animals and the voice of the spider was done by julia roberts this brought in $52.5 million. And just below the prestige at uh, ooh, number 60 was the Lake House at $52.3 million. Now, Toppy, did you ever see the Lake House? No, I was just going to say never. I, I don't recall anything about it. It oh. sounds like maybe it was spooky or something. Um, not entirely. It, it, it was spooky in that they allowed these two people to do another movie together. Um, yeah, it was it was Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves from the Speed movies. Um, oh. I think this may be the only other film that they have done together. But spoiler alert, Keanu Reeves is a dead man. And the rest of the movie after the first, I don't know, half hour is all in flashbacks. So, um, yeah, I wanted my money back. It, it, it wasn't the greatest movie. It's probably not the worst I saw, but it involved her going to the mailbox for letters a whole lot. <laughs> all right. All right. <clears throat> well, let's start off with the, the director. Well, um, did, I, did we yeah. want to play the trailer for this thing? Yes! yes All please. right, let's go with that. And this was 2006. If you were the movie-going sort, this is what you would have seen as a teaser for The Prestige. Show me. Come on. No, I can't show Do it! <laughs> How'd you like that? Well, how'd you do it? Magic. I'll perform this feat in a manner never before seen by yourselves or any other audience anywhere in the world. The audience loved it. This trick is top notch. You need to celebrate. <laughs> a real magician tries to invent something new. 
It's something that other magicians will scratch their heads over. I suppose you have such a trick. Yes, you I do. It's the one they're gonna remember me for. What happened? It was the greatest magic trick I've ever seen. I need to know how he does it. He has no trick. It's real. Every great magic trick consists of three acts. The first act is called the pledge. The magician shows you something ordinary. But of course, it probably isn't. The second act is called the turn. He's obsessed with discovering your method. The magician makes this ordinary something do something extraordinary. Huh. Now you're looking for the secret, but you won't find it. That's why there's a third act called The Prestige. This is the part with the twists and turns, where lives hang in the balance. And you see something shocking you've never seen before. This was built by a man who can actually do what magicians pretend to do. Real magic. I know what you really are. How does he do it? You want the truth. Nothing is impossible. Secrets of my life. Well, there was about as much action in that as a lot of those uh, 60s films we've discussed. You, you kind of have to see it to understand what was going on, but believe me, uh, you did not uh, blink for a moment. <laughs> a, lot, a lot was going on. And this is the kind of movie that Christopher Nolan has made his name on, which uh, is just very complex storytelling. So Christopher Nolan, the director, was born in 1970. He's a British-American filmmaker. And uh, he's, well, today he's considered a leading filmmaker of the 21st century, no doubt about it. His films have grossed $5 billion worldwide, He's won many, many awards, nominated five times for the Academy Award, five times for BAFTA Awards, nominated six times for Golden Globe Awards. And Time Magazine, for what it's worth, uh, listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, uh, as far as the British Empire is concerned, in 2019, they appointed... Christopher Nolan, commander of the Order of the British Empire, for his contributions to film. So one of the guy, reasons I find this guy really interesting is that he's another one of these people that as a kid went around making his own movies on 8mm film and Super 8 film with his little camera. And, uh, and he started doing this... <clears throat> really early on, like when he was seven, and he would have the kids from the neighborhood uh, be in his movies, and he would all have them acting in them. And, well, by the age of 11, Nolan knew that's what he wanted to be, was a professional filmmaker. So he earned his bachelor degree in uh, English literature in 1993 at the University College London, uh, uh, where he was making student films and uh, learning the business. Um, early on, uh, Nolan did everything. Uh, he worked as a script reader, a camera operator. Uh, he did. Uh, he directed corporate videos. He directed industrial films. So he did. He just did everything he could to gain experience. Um, and he also directed and wrote several of his own short films. One was called Larceny in 96, and one was called Doodlebug in 97. And uh, and uh, after that, it was time uh, to for Nolan to try to make a, a, a feature movie. And he did so with his girlfriend at the time, who later became his wife. Her name's Emma Thomas. And in the mid-90s, uh, they tried to make a movie called Larry Mahoney that just 
didn't go anywhere. They struggled. They they scraped. They scrapped for it. And uh, it just didn't work. And and this was a huge disappointment because this was their their first huge project. And it left Nolan with kind of a eh, a little bit of a bitterness towards the British film industry because he felt like they didn't support him at all. You know, no grants, no nothing. He didn't get any any help at all. But um, um, after that, he didn't give up. He conceived the idea for his first uh, feature that was made. And this is cool, folks. He he financed it between him and his girlfriend and the actor he got, was who was a friend. And uh, they made this over the course of a year. It was shot on black and white film, uh, a cheap stock. And Nolan wrote it. He directed it. He photographed it. He edited it. And uh, it was called a, a Following. And it was released in 1998. And it depicts an unemployed young writer, uh, his friend Jeremy Theobald, um, who trails strangers through London, hoping they will provide material for his first novel. But he's drawn into a criminal underworld when he fails to keep his distance. And uh, it was made on a budget of about 3,000 pounds. And uh, they just shot it on weekends over the course of a year. And this movie won several awards during its festival run and was very well received by critics who all thought this Nolan guy was a majorly talented debutant. Two years later, Nolan gained international recognition with his second film, it was called Memento in 2000. It was nominated for the Academy Award for a Best Original Screenplay. Two years after that, Nolan transitioned from doing these independent movies to studio filmmaking because he left England and he went to Hollywood and he went to Warner Brothers where he made Insomnia in 2002 which led to further critical and commercial success. He went on to do the Dark Knight trilogy. Imagine that. After really just three, he really can only count two of them, because and, and after two movies, he's given the Dark Knight trilogy to do. Whoa. Um, in the, in a, at some point, kind of in the middle of the Dark Knight trilogy, mm-hmm. or in between those movies, he did uh, The Prestige, our movie tonight, and Inception. And these last two movies earned Nolan two Oscar nominations, Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. Um, after the Dark Knight trilogy was completed... Uh, It was followed by Interstellar in 2014, Dunkirk in 2017, Tenet in 2020. And for Dunkirk, he earned two Academy Award nominations, including his first for Best Director. So uh, uh, his work is typically characterized by complex ideology. Epistemology, which I had to look up, uh, is a major theme in his movies. Epistemology is the study of nature, origin, and the scope of knowledge, the rational, the rationality of belief, and various related issues. And his other main theme is existentialism. Had to look that up, too. And now, uh, existentialism is the analysis of individual existence in an unfathomable universe and the plight of the individual who must assume ultimate responsibility for acts of free will without any certain knowledge of what is right or wrong or good or bad. So very metaphysical outlook and all of his movies reflect this. 
Uh, he explores ethics, the construction of time, the malleable nature of memory, and personal identity. So uh, several, he's worked uh, very much with his brother, who's gone on to do many other things independently of him, but his brother, Jonathan Nolan, uh, was responsible primarily for the script of The Prestige, because uh, uh, Christopher Nolan was too busy with the Dark Knight trilogy to to write this up, so his brother did it. And it was based on a novel, uh, who and I forget who wrote it, Christopher somebody, Christopher Pierce, I think, wrote the novel. And uh, today, um, uh, Christopher Nolan runs the production company Syncope Inc. with his wife, film producer, Emma Thomas. So uh, I that is the story of our director tonight, Christopher Nolan. All righty. So we are at a little more than the halfway mark in the show. So we're going to step on over here to the snack counter. And um, I hear that Gertie has been practicing a magic act. Um, be careful. Your wallets might disappear. Woohoo! Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, didn't you go to juvie for that, Gertie? Okay. Well, she probably did. Yeah. So, uh, for your listening enjoyment, we have an interview with the director, Christopher Nolan, and this is with the Hollywood Archive. This is a brilliant film, and oh, honestly, you. Christopher, I don't know how you keep topping yourself. What's your secret? Gosh. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, my secret is simply that I, I take on every film as if it's the last film I get to make, because it might be. Well, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you focus single-mindedly on doing, doing the best you can with, uh, with that project. How much of a challenge was this, not only to direct it, but you and your brother co-wrote this? And mm -hmm. I would think, you know, it, you don't want to give things away. You want the audience to be just at the edge of their seat for the entire film, mm -hmm. which we are. How much of a challenge was that for you? The big challenge was uh, adapting Christopher Priest's novel. It's it's a big sprawling novel with, you know, ten different films in there really, and it took us years. I mean, it took us about, I mean, really five or six years to to focus in on the essential elements that we felt would would make the movie uh, that we wanted to see from it. And so it was a complicated uh, puzzle really. And showing magic on screen, you know, a lot of people yeah. would think. Well, you know, we can use trick photography and stuff, but there's not nothing like that in this film. That must have been challenging too. It the, well, it was it was challenging to conceive at, at script stage of okay, well, how do you create the sense of magic uh, without just showing magic tricks? Because magic tricks through the camera can be really meaningless uh, because of you know camera tricks and CG and all the rest, which the audience is very aware of the, that possibility. And so. We decided to use the narrative itself, to use the story to create the sense of magic, to create the, the tricks, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the only magic we see in the film is really done, you know, for real. And the actors learn how to do small, you know, productions and, and, dis and vanishes, uh, press the digitation, you know, these little tricks you do with your hands. Because we just wanted to be able to show very casually, as a, as a throwaway thing in the film, just the, the skill that they would have, uh, just to give these guys credibility mm -hmm. as magicians. And, exactly. You know, that's a fun thing to just see a little throwaway vanish, a little throwaway production. Uh, the bigger scale stuff, we wanted to go behind the scenes and, and below the stage and show how these things would have been put together. Yeah. Really try and immerse the audience in the mysterious world of, of magic and yeah. magicians. That was fantastic. I loved watching that stuff. Uh, the casting, you know, I mean, Christian Bale, obviously, know that guy so well from Batman. I mean, there's no yeah. question. Uh, the intensity between him and Hugh Jackman, I mean, what... Hugh, for me, is absolutely one of my favorite actors, and mm. it must have been a thrill for you to see these two men working. Just tell me a little bit about working It was with you. terrific working with these two guys. Um, I mean, Christian I'd worked with before, but never seen him do anything like this exactly, and it was fun to watch him really you know, get his teeth into this, this role. And Hugh Jackman, you know, I've felt for a long time, is a terrific film actor who hasn't really yet yeah. been able to show what he can do, and I think in this film he gets to do things that... He's never done before, and I think people will be hugely impressed by his performance. He was amazing to watch. And I've seen him in, on stage. I saw The Boy From Oz a few times, mm. actually. I'm a huge fan of his. And I, you know, to me, even though, yes, he's a brilliant film actor, but his comfort is so on that stage. 
his comfort is so on that stage, and that was so important to this part. He gets to do both things in this film. He gets to act at that very uh, particular small f movie level where your face is 60 feet on screen, but he also gets to show his facility with an audience, a stage, uh, because his character, the, the essence of his character is he's not the best magician, but he's the best showman. He really knows how to convince an audience, how to involve an audience in, in what he's doing. And he really has that natural ability, and you just you feel it as soon as he steps on that stage. All righty, so there is a, uh, well, you know, a, a backstage full of talent that makes up a cast for a film like this. And uh, first out of the gate is our leading man, uh, the, the young bachelor, played by Mr. Christian Bale. His character is Alfred Borden, which is kind of a twist if you think about it, considering that Batman's uh, butler was Alfred. Anyways, so Christian Bale, he was born in Wales in the UK. That's that uh, part of the country that's out there to the west. And, uh, you know, King Charlie was uh, the prince of. Anyways, uh, Christian Bale had English parents. And his mother was a circus performer. And his father was born in South Africa and was a commercial pilot. Well, I know how they met. The family lived in different countries throughout Bale's childhood, including England, Portugal, and the United States. Bale acknowledges the constant that constant change was one of the influences on his career choice. He began acting on television in the mid to late 80s. His first film role was starring in Steven Spielberg's The Empire of the Sun way back in 87, which starred John Malkovich and Miranda Richardson. It was about a young English boy struggles to survive under Japanese occupation of China during World War II. Bringing it up to tonight's film, The Prestige, this was Christian Bale's 27th film. Did he have as many films as he had years at that time? Hmm. His film before The Prestige was a film called Rescue Dawn. It was also released in 2006. It was about a U.S. fighter pilot's epic struggle of survival after being shot down on a mission over Laos during the Vietnam War. His film after The Prestige was 310 to Yuma in 2007, which also starred Russell Crowe. And that was about a small-time rancher who agrees to hold a captured outlaw who's awaiting a train to go to court in Yuma. A battle of wills ensues as the outlaw tries to psych out the rancher. Continuing on about Christian Bale's career, in the five years that would follow The Prestige, Bale would appear in seven films, including his second appearance as the new Batman in The Dark Knight in 2008 and in Terminator Salvation in 2009 with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which was the fourth of six installments in that franchise. In 2011, Bale would star in The Flowers of War, which is about an American who finds ref refuge during the 1937 invasion Japanese invasion of Nanking in a church with a group of women. He posed as a priest and attempts to find, or sorry, and attempts to lead the women to safety. And then in 2012, Bale would make his third and final appearance as Bruce Wayne in The Dark Knight Rises. Christian Bale continues to act to this day and has 55 credits to his name. Most recently, he appeared in three films he kept busy in 2022, including Thor, Love and Thunder. He was also in a film with up-and-coming Margot Robbie, who's in the new Barbie film, and uh, also with Chris Rock and Taylor Swift in this film, a film called Amsterdam in 2022. And then this most recent film, which I remember actually seeing a preview for in the theater, is called The Pale Blue Eye. And he played an investigator into the death of a West Point cadet and enlists the help of the man who would later become known as Edgar Allan Poe. Ooh. And that is Christian Bale in a moment. <clears throat> All right. Well, right opposite Mr. Bale was Hugh Jackman, uh, who portrayed 
Robert Angier, 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 Angier. That's how it was pronounced, Angier. <laughs> he was born in 1968. He's an Australian actor. He began his career in theater and television. And as we all know, his big breakthrough role was as Logan Wolverine in the X-Men film series. Uh appearing in a whole bunch of them between 2000 and 2017. But uh, he's recognized for much more than that uh, and is the winner of uh, various awards, including Golden Globe, uh, Primetime Emmys, the Grammy Award, two Tonys. Keep in mind, uh, he loves uh, singing and dancing and uh, is a true... A theater actor at heart. Um, he won uh, the uh, BAFTA. Uh, Jackman was oh he okay another official title uh, this time over in Australia. Jackman was appointed a companion of the Order of Australia in 2019, presumably for his work uh, as an actor. Oh, well, he's headlined films in a whole lot of genres, including uh, romantic comedy like Kate and Leopold in 2001. Uh, He's done horror, uh, action movies, Van Helsing in 2004, The uh, Prestige and and our movie tonight in 26. He did a period romance, Australia in 2008. He was in the T, uh, the movie version of Les Miserables in 2012. He was in the thriller Prisoners in thir- 2013. And another musical, The Greatest Showman in 2017. Uh, then a political drama, The Front Runner in 2018. A crime drama, Bad Education in 2019. And uh, for his role as Jean Valjean, in Les Miserables, Jackman was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor and won a Golden Globe Award for Best Actor. And for the Greatest Showman soundtrack, well, he got a Grammy. Uh, so there you go. Uh, well, his early theater role uh, that kind of uh, solidified him uh, in theater was Oklahoma. Uh, that was way back in 1998, and soon after he appeared in Carousel. Uh, later, he moved to Broadway, uh, where he won the 2004 Tony Award for Best Actor in a Musical for his role in The Boy from Oz. And uh, also on Broadway, uh, from 2021 to 2022, he started as con man Harold Hill in the revival of the musical the music man and he got another tony award nomination so uh boy such a wide variety of work and he's managed to juggle theater and major blockbuster movies like the x-men uh and he's done very well for himself and i think uh he does a fine turn in tonight's movie the prestige so, DJ, what about Scarlet? Hmm, Scarlet. Oh, no, wait, that's the other one. Ah, oh, well, Scarlet Johansson uh, played Olivia. Now, if you have not seen The Prestige, um, it is available for rent in most places like uh, Amazon Prime, probably YouTube, and Apple TV. Yeah, I rented, I rented it off uh, Amazon. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well... Um, Scarlet's character of Olivia is, um, the up and coming magician's assistant. She steps in when a tragedy occurs and, uh, Hugh Jackman's character loses his wife. So, uh, she's a pretty thing and she's there to distract, but she's also there to spy. Scarlet Ingrid Johansson was born in 84 in, Ah! in Manhattan. She's an American actress and uh, was the world's highest paid actress in 2018 and 19. She more on that later. Yes, she has multiple times on the... She's been on uh, the Forbes Celebrity 100 list multiple times. 
and uh, Time Magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2021. Her films have grossed over 14.3 billion, folks, with a B, like Burger King, worldwide, oh, mm -hmm. making Johansson the highest grossing box office star of all time. I bet you she's got the new iPhone. <laughs> uh, now, listen, when I when I read that, <clears throat> I said, holy F-bomb. Mm -hmm. Are you serious? Are you freaking serious? And uh, the only reason I, I can imagine that this is the case, the highest grossing box of a star of all time, is because she happened to be in all of those Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. That's the, I can't explain it any other way. Yeah. She uh, was Black Widow in a million movies. Mm-hmm. As a child, Johansson practiced acting by staring into the mirror until she made herself cry. Uh, well, you know, depending on the neighborhood you grew up in, that might have been easy. Um, she wanted to be ah. like Judy Garland and meet me in St. Louis, and she decided to become an actress. Wow, she watched something on VHS. Um, Johansson later played minor roles such as the daughter of Sean Connery and Kate Capshaw's character in the mystery thriller Just Cause and an art student in If Lucy Fell in 96. Johansson's first leading role was as Amanda, the younger sister of a pregnant teenager who runs away. Okay, this is an after school special, surely. Uh, ah. Away from her foster home in Manny and Lowe, also yeah, in 96. I, I certainly don't remember. <laughs> um, and in 98, Johansson attracted wider attention for her performance in the film The Horse Whisperer co-starring director Robert Redford. Well, of course. Johansson received an introducing credit on this film, although it was her seventh role. For the film, she was nominated for the Chicago Films Critics Association Award for the Most Promising Actress, or, you know, the one most likely to get Robert Redford's phone number. Ah, John Johansson later appeared in My Brother the big because whose isn't and in the cone brothers neo noir film the man who wasn't there in 01 but her big breakthrough came playing a cynical outcast in terry zwigoff's black comedy ghost world in 2001 now i've got another movie to look up here johansson transitioned from teen to adult roles with two films in 2003 the romantic drama lost in translation oh God, that's, she was the only good thing in that movie. It was literally ah. about Bill Murray being trapped in a hotel in Japan while being a Z-lister endorsing a brand of liquor. Okay, anyways, happy thoughts. Um, and the drama Girl with a Pearl Earring, receiving much critical acclaim. And finally, in The Prestige, Johansson had a supporting role of assistant and lover of Jackman's character. Oh, who doesn't want to be? And an aristocratic magician in Christopher Nolan's mystery thriller. Nolan thought Johansson possessed ambiguity, well, and a low-cut dress, and a shielded ah. quality. On the other hand, Johansson was fascinated with Nolan's directing methods and liked working with him. The film was well, a critical yes. and box office success recommended by the Los Angeles Times as an adult provocative piece of work. Piece of work? Okay. Johansson began portraying Black Widow in the Marvel Cinematic Universe film Iron Man 2. She reprised the role in eight films, leading up to her solo feature Black Widow in 2021 and gaining Johansson global stardom and a new right. iPhone every year. That, right. That, that's got to be why she's the highest grossing box sucker star of all time, Right. I mean, it's gotta be. You know, the Dalai Lama probably personally seals her bottle of water. Yeah, I guess, but you know, um, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it apparently it's not. She's just not the the, fe mo the 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 female who who's gotten that. It's out of everybody, hmm. which is why I just think it's like, well, it's just crazy. Anyways, moving on. Uh, there's many, many other notable cast members in this movie 
uh, primarily Michael Caine, who is sort of um, a mentor uh, to uh, uh, Hugh Jackman's character. Mm -hmm. But most interestingly, uh, Nikola Tesla, the real-life inventor, uh, who uh, competed with uh, and had such a terrible time with that evil Thomas Edison. Mm-hmm. Who's the man who invented the electric chair, by the way. Yeah, and also loved to electrocute elephants. He really did. Anyways, that's a whole nother story. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he was an evil man. I'm sorry. He was. He was clever. Uh, he made a lot of inventions, but he was a nasty nasty thief uh anyway uh nikola tesla it was in this movie he creates a device for uh um, hugh jackman's character uh, a device that he can use in his magic shows that's going to be a make him a smash sensation and um he's portrayed by david bowie uh, and uh, apparently Nolan, Christopher Nolan, the director, wanted someone who was not necessarily a film star, but was extraordinarily charismatic. And Nolan stated that Bowie was really the only guy I had in mind to play Tesla because his function in the story is a small but very important role. Uh, b- but Bowie said, uh, no thanks, not interested. Well, Nolan didn't give up, and he flew out to New York to meet with Bowie in person to pitch the whole thing to him. And the story goes that in no less than two minutes, Bowie said, okay, 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 I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, there you go. Yeah, I I mean, uh, I enjoyed this film. Um, there have not been many films with Christopher uh, Bale that I have watched, only because I... I generally speaking have a problem with longer films especially if the lighting is dark okay i'm coming up on my mid-century in a handful of years here so it's just bound to happen but um you know hugh jackman is the reason that my um my car directions have an australian accent okay um (laughs) but uh michael kane and david bowie were big draws for me in this film and without spoiling anything, because this is a semi-recent film, and others may be encouraged to watch it, hopefully. Um, Toppy, would you say that Michael Caine's character, the uh, you know the, uh, the the showrunner, basically, do you do you think that he knew the secret to the the magic trick the younger guy was doing? Oh, good lord! Did he know? <sighs> yes. Yes, he absolutely knew. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he did know. This this movie does provoke conversation, and Hubby had seen it probably when it was new in theaters, but watched it with me and remembered. So we had a discussion on that, on uh, whether or not we thought Michael Caine's character knew the secret oh, of the magic trick. Wait a minute. I changed my answer. Yeah? Uh, Hugh Jackman's character very much wanted Michael Caine's character to not know the secret. And he kept insisting, you stay out front. Don't go backstage or downstage. Oh, no. What, I don't what, what, want what, you to know. What I'm referring to is the original act that Hugh oh. Jackman's character is imitating. Yeah. You know, the that first act by uh, Christian Bale's character. D- did Michael Caine know what the secret of that act was, and is that why he tried to coach Hugh Jackman's character to not imitate it? Well, understood. Are you talking about the rubber ball and the transport? Yeah, I mean, it eventually eventually involves a person, but it's the same idea. So he simply being uh, a knowledgeable person uh, engineer and behind the scenes in creating illusions, Michael Caine's character decided the only way it could be done was with uh, a double mm-hmm. and insisted that's how it was done, uh, that it was a double. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, the the um, only thing that uh, well the 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 main takeaway I got from this film was that I wish that David Bowie had more screen time. I mean, um, there were far too few programs, films, whatever you want to call them, that had David Bowie in his lifetime. And I would have watched a whole biopic or biopic, whatever you want to call it, with him as Nikola Tesla. But I enjoyed this film. It was thought-provoking, and it made you question um, the, the, the motivations people have in doing things. I, for one, want to know how uh, Angier, which was Jackman's character, how he got the kind of money he needed to travel to the States and enlist Tesla. I mean, this kind of person doesn't need to be performing magic acts to make money if he can fly abroad and, you know, pay this uh, well, inventor. Well, sail, sail <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's explained, actually, that's touched on in the last moments of the movie when we find out the real background of Jackman's character. It's, it's another spoiler, so I'm not going to say, but... Mm -hmm. But it turns out uh, Hugh Jackman's character, who said early on in the movie, there's no way I could pretend to be another guy my whole life. I just couldn't do it. Oh. And at the, at the end, well, let's just say we discover he has been pretending his whole life so to this, be another guy. Uh, so this was kind of a side gig that we were watching him doing. Well, let's just say he had much more money and came from a background of wealth mm -hmm. that he kept that he kept hidden he, he, uh, oh yeah so you know as and, i as i often say to co-workers in different places i don't really need this job i'm secretly independently wealthy and i just come here to occupy my mind <laughs> there you go <laughs> So, um, I also enjoyed this movie very much. This was only my second time watching it. This is a movie that almost requires multiple viewing. If you're even going to understand it, there's so much going on. It's intentionally done that way. It's intentionally a challenge to follow. The whole story is completely non-linear. It doesn't start at the beginning and end at the end. It goes bouncing 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 uh, from time uh, to different times in these characters life and it reveals exactly what it wants to reveal to you when it wants to reveal it to you but if you're not watching and you're not you know you can't like be doing something else uh, you can't be on your phone playing candy crush when you're watching this movie or you're, you're, it's just going to be lost on you. This is a movie that demands your attention, is very challenging, but worth it, I think, to pay attention and try to guess the whole mystery of what's going on, because that's where it keeps you. It keeps you guessing, what? What's going on here? I'm missing something. Something's not right. Mm -hmm. Something's off. What is it? And it relentlessly takes you across the span of years where finally, at the end, everything comes together in an amazing way that freaking blows your mind. And it's the kind of story uh, Christopher Nolan, just sort of with his different movies... Uh, sort of became famous for his little twist, his little mind-blowing stuff. And this movie pulls it off. And even, okay, I still don't know a lot of the things that happened in this movie. Mm -hmm. It is so complex. I'd have to watch it again. I know I'm missing things. I just know it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't let that worry you. Watch it and maybe try it a second time if you really like it. You will be rewarded with every reviewing. I can guarantee you that because you will discover more and more with each viewing. And I'm looking forward to watching again and picking up even more than the last time. 
So it's I this is an extraordinary piece of work. The acting's great. The sets, the set decoration, the cinematography captures this gaslight era. You know, there's a little bit of electricity in there because of Tesla. Mm -hmm. It looks beautiful. It's it it's marvelous to look at and I can't recommend it enough, but it will confound you. It yeah. will confound you. Yeah, and I do agree. It is something worth viewing. Um, it will keep you guessing. Uh, as someone from another, a, a, an older generation might say, you want to watch this straight. Uh, don't, uh, you know, have any uh, a, any funny lawn clippings or any strong drinks because you're not going to figure things out. But, yeah. uh, uh, but um, On the other hand... If you were to be smoking some lawn clippings, the ending is going to be even more mind blowing. To you. <laughs> now I uh, now I do feel that I owe uh, a a debt to my fellow animal lovers out this out there, and I will say this gently, just because I I want you to be cautioned when you're watching this film. This takes place in the 1890s. It was a different time, and we had different sensibilities. For goodness sakes, it was practically a generation before women got the right to vote. Uh, never mind have their own bank accounts, but um, there is period relevant, and by that I mean this is the way they acted in that time, animal violence. Now, because this was a film from 2006, I am absolutely sure that no animals were harmed in the making of this film. But there is, no, no, no. De there are depictions which are brief of animals that could have been harmed in Victorian era London. Yeah, they were important plot points uh, for the movie, and every everything that this movie was conveying. Uh, there was uh, no no way they could get around it. So that would be a trigger warning. I would say the other trigger warning is uh, drowning. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that triggers you, for God's sake, um, approach this movie with caution. And, you know, for what it's worth, Hugh Jackman re redeems himself because his character is uh, aghast at the uh, the cruelty. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's 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 not overt. It's not anything that happens on screen. You do see a brief depiction of the results. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's quite brief. They don't dwell on it. You could fast but forward it, because you can tell it's coming. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Tommy, I don't know if you got to see this movie, but I. Sure forgot to warn you about that, and I wish I had, so... I don't know, tell us in the chat room if you watched it um, and turned it... I don't know. Anyways, I, I really totally forgot, Tommy, to warn you about uh, the animal stuff in this movie. Okay. Somewhere somebody is angrily scribing your name into a wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh, arsonists and graffiti, um, we're getting out here to the lobby because Gertie's got to catch her bus soon. So let's move on to the part of the program we like to call our snack tray. This is what's left over after the conversation, and we're going to tell you about other things you might enjoy if you like films such as The Prestige, or Prestige. Uh, so I'm going to recommend a film from a few years before. It's from 2000, and uh, this is a film called Memento, you know, like a memory or a keepsake. And this is a film with Guy Pearce and um, the, the actress from the Matrix movies, Carrie Ann Moss. It's a man with a sh with short-term memory loss attempts to track down his wife's murderer. All right. Now I'm looking backwards because is this not a Christopher Nolan movie? Oh, it probably is. I mean... Uh, uh, I think so. Uh, y y if you're going to compare apples to apples, you, you, yeah. you have to stay on the Memento. crazy train. Memento was in 2000 and was indeed... By our man tonight, Christopher mm. Nolan. So, no wonder it 
you thought of it. I'm the uh, ticket taker on the crazy train tonight. Yeah. Um, I have. No, I have seen that. I have seen it. And, and, and that's, that's certainly. Memento is certainly another movie where another viewing is almost required to just like, okay, I need to see this again because I'm a little lost. <laughs> so. Here's a weird thing. I'm going to recommend The Illusionist. Oddly enough, coincidentally, it came out the same year Mm. as The Prestige 2006. It is also a movie about magicians at the same time period. So I don't know what that was all about. There's been many, many times uh, that uh, movies have come out of the same sort. I, and I don't know if it's because somebody finds out somebody's doing something and says, wait a minute, I got an idea just like that. Let's get it out before they do. Uh, just for an example, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. Somebody said, let's do a movie about an an asteroid hitting Earth. (laughs) And uh, so uh, Deep Impact came out. But the same goddamn year, that other movie with Bruce Willis. Armageddon. Armageddon came out. And that just seems to happen a lot. At any rate, The Illusionist is also about a magician during the industrial age it's a period piece it's a mystery film uh it's directed by neil berger and it stars edward norton paul giamatti and jessica beale and it's loosely based on a novel uh, actually not a novel i'm sorry a short story by stephen milhauser uh it was called eisenheim the illusionist And this movie tells the story of Eisenheim, a magician in the turn of century Vienna, who reunites with his childhood love, a woman far above his social standing. And he, well, as the movie goes along, he uses his ability as a magician to increases social standing and win the love of this woman it's so similar to the prestige minus the you got to watch it a second time to figure it out this movie is perfectly clear what happens but it does have a bit of a twist at the end um and i'll i swear uh, uh, the prestige and the illusionist are, are almost interlocked in my mind Uh, because of their similarities. They're both excellent movies. So that's what I recommend. If you like The Prestige, watch The Illusionist. Mm, Okay. Well, it's so late that Gertie has had to call an Uber. So, uh, yeah, we'll we'll have to make sure that that check clears this time. Anyways, so, um, well, uh, before we get going, we're going to let the listeners know what's coming up next. So... Uh, Toppy, this place had a magic jack once. Grab us that bag of coins so we can figure out what's coming up next. All right. Coins. Okay, we're going to put that in the machine. Come on. Ooh, all righty. A capsule. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll read the uh, the note. Oh, goodness. First of all, we'd really like you to know that on 519, which would normally be our next show, there will be no show. Why? Because it's none other than DJ and Billy's anniversary. 14 years. Yep. So we're going to allow them to be excused and we're going to skip a week. Uh, But... uh, Let's see. Oh, okay. Our our next after that, and it's going to be uh, Friday, 
June 2nd. That's the next show we're going to do, also at 9 p.m. as usual. We're going to do uh, in tribute to the forthcoming 60th anniversary of who? Oh, did I say who? Yes, <laughs> of Doctor Who. Uh, we're going to have a guest, Paul Chandler from the Shy Life podcast, who is a gigantic fan of Doctor Who. And we also hope, although things could change because of work schedules, but we certainly hope that Billy, uh, your hubby, who is also a major Doctor Who fan, um, will be able to be our guests next time as we discuss not the TV show, but a very interesting movie in 1966 of Doctor Who and uh, did it not um, did it not uh, star Peter Cushing? It did. Am I wrong? Yes. Okay, thought so. So we're going to talk about the 1966 movie version of Doctor Who starring Peter Cushing. It's called Dalek's Invasion of Earth 2150 A.D. And uh, that's what we'll be talking about. But we'll get into all eras, I'm sure, of Doctor Who and the whole shebang. Um, and I know, DJ, you're a big fan of Doctor Who, too, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. my first exposure, honk, was my uncle coming to uh, watch reruns on our TV. And then uh, many years later, Hubby introduced me to it again when it was new and live back in 2009. Yeah, my only exposure to Doctor Who was in the 70s with uh, Who's Its Face with the long scarf and the goofy hair. Tom Baker. Tom Baker. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, so I'm fascinated by Doctor Who, although I've, I've missed most of it, I must say, including the most recent, uh, um, you know, TV series that have, have come out that have been uh, quite extraordinary. I've seen a few episodes. DJ showed me a, a couple of them the last time I visited. And they're, I mean, the budget. I mean, once upon a time, Doctor Who was a, had a measly shoestring budget. Well, no more. Uh, the new stuff they're doing over, the, you know, since the last 10 years anyways. Uh, well, I mean, you know, this stuff looks movie quality. Mm -hmm. Anyways, Doctor Who went on forever in uh, Great Britain. Uh, and uh, it's, it's fascinating history. So that's next time. But next time, remember is not going to be until June 2nd. Uh, so uh, hang hang loose until then. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Doctor Who has as many actors in the lead as I have years with my hubby. Fourteen! Well, okay, okay, okay. Just, just give us... Okay, 14 people have portrayed Doctor Who, but tell, mm -hmm. tell us... How many years Doctor Who has been a thing on TV? Well, it's been around for 60 years. There was probably, there go, a, folks. probably a decade that it was off the air. 60 years, folks. That, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's a history right there. Yeah. Well, uh, Gertie's Uber has shown up, and coincidentally, it's her nephew. Um, we better let her get going because he's still got that ankle alarm thing on. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Did you have to mention that? Oh, I know. Uh, we'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear about that next time. Yeah, so let us know. Look over the balcony and tell us who was here with us tonight. All right. We're, we do this live. We do have a chat room. Um, people can watch us live on YouTube. Almost always. It's the first and third Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and we're very often joined by a dedicated group of people who uh, keep us company, and tonight we had uh, your hubby, Billy, was here. Uh, we had the ever-mysterious Cronhaven. Uh, we have Lamont Cranston from New York City. Mm. 
uh, with us. And thank you, Lamont, for being here. We also have always, always, always our best pal, Tommy Hash Browns, here tonight. And we thank you for keeping us company live. All right. Well, if you would do the honor, sir, say goodnight in the ways of the old days of radio. Uh, Good night, Gracie. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live on the first and third Friday of the month. Go to univospods.net, click the tower for audio, enter Discord for chat. You can find our show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Find our group on Facebook. Have an idea for a show? Or why not let us know how we're doing? Email us at matineeminutia at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Joe's gone wild with Matt and Tom. Speak up. The Smellcast by Tommy Smelly. Be heard. It tastes like burning with Tim and James. Unique voices in podcasting. The Shy Life Podcast. With me, Paul the Shy Yeti. Univazpods.net.